As we continue our studies of signaling in Chapter 10, let's next consider the activation of protein kinase A. Let's first review the process of G-protein signaling considered in our previous lesson and illustrated in the figure at the top of our slide. Recall that epinephrine binds to its receptor, that's the left of our figure, which induces a conformational change in that receptor and allowing it to interact with a membrane anchored G protein, which in turn activates the G protein. This activation involves the release of GDP and the binding of GTP to its alpha subunit. The active G alpha subunit then binds to and activates a membrane bound enzyme, adenylate cyclase, stimulating it to produce cyclic AMP. What we want to see now is how cyclic AMP activates the enzyme protein kinase A or PKA. On the right we see a schematic representation of the structure of protein kinase A. Its inactive form consists of a tetramer that is essentially a dimer of dimers. There are two regulatory subunits shaded pink in our figure and two catalytic subunits in blue. In this tetrameric form at the top of our figure, the active sites of the catalytic subunits are blocked by the presence of the regulatory or R subunits. As the concentration of cyclic AMP elevates, two molecules of cyclic AMP bind to each of the R subunits. This induces a conformational change resulting in dissociation and release of the monomeric catalytic subunits at the bottom of our figure. These are now capable of binding substrate. Note that each activated tetramer releases two active catalytic proteins. Protein kinase A can be further activated by phosphorylation. The activation loop of protein kinase A highlighted in the figure on the lower right in dark green, carries a threonine residue that becomes phosphorylated. The presence of the negatively charged phosphoryl group allows it to interact with an adjacent positively charged arginine side chain. This conformation ensures that an aspartate residue is positioned in the active site where it can interact with the substrate highlighted in blue. This properly positions the substrate for phosphoryl transfer from ATP. Keep in mind protein kinase A is a kinase, so it phosphorylates its target substrate. If the activation loop of protein kinase A is not phosphorylated, it blocks the active site and thereby decreases substrate affinity. Let's next look at the downstream effects of protein kinase A act illustrated in our figure here. You'll want to recall that we're looking at the downstream effects of the hormone epinephrine associated with the fight or flight response, which signals, signals a fuel need. In this case, we want to activate fuel use and inhibit fuel storage. Protein kinase A actually exerts both of these effects and is marked by the blue arrow in our figure. It inhibits the enzyme glycogen synthase, thereby inhibiting the storage of glucose as glycogen. It also stimulates an enzyme, phosphorylase kinase, that in turn activates enzymes needed, by, needed for fuel use, including glycogen phosphorylase, that makes glucose available for muscle contraction, and a lipase that stimulates release of fatty acids as fuel from adipocytes. All of these cascade effects come from stimulating one enzyme, protein kinase A. In our next video lesson, we want to see how we can attenuate these effects when it's time to terminate the signal. We'll also review the changes that take place within the cell during this process.